Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And um, time is rapidly running out on us, our second last uh, class for examination. And um, uh, today we're gonna to be discussing forensic aspects, fire and explosion. Um, I'm gonna do my best to get through as much of this as I can today. I may have to run over time a bit, but I want at least some small amount of time tomorrow to be able to at least introduce the topic of computer and cell phone forensic investigation. Just a brief introduction tomorrow. Okay, so um, the fire and explosion are both obviously uh, can be catastrophic events, uh, which involve not only the physical destruction by flame, by actual burning, but in case of explosion also involves destruction by means of force of a blast wave. Both fire and explosions can occur accidentally. That is, that is true. Um, but they are also, both of them, frequently used as method, methods of crime. And um, usually for, for two purposes. Um, one, the commission of murder, for example, but second, the commission of arson for the purposes of things like insurance fraud and that sort of thing. So these are these definitely are frequently occur as part of a criminal endeavor. But any fire, any major explosion is going to result in a forensic investigation to determine its origin and to determine whether or not it's accidental or whether it was deliberate. So that is pretty much what we're going to be discussing today. Now, in the case of the use of fire, the willful malicious use of destruct burning of property in commission of a crime, in other words, with fraudulent intent, and uh, is by definition arson. That is what arson is. It is the criminal use of fire to commit a crime. The problem with um, both fire and explosions, however, uh, is that they're extremely complex crime scenes. And they are very much complicated usually by the fact, first of all, that the, the person who does it has usually planned it out really carefully. Most frequently, the perpetrator is not even present when the, the actual event takes place. They distance themselves from, from the event. But the most important thing of all is about these crime scenes is that much of the evidence is destroyed along with the, the property or whatever it is that has been, has been set alight. And it's destroyed through two things. It's, first of all, it's destroyed by the fire itself. That is the first thing. That's the in, uh, in the case of arson, that's the intent. But the, much evidence may also be destroyed and very, very rapidly by attempts to put the fire out. Water, for example, sprayed on the fire by um, fire department will very rapidly wash away evidence. And, con and also destroy evidence, conceal evidence as well, and complicate the entire scene. So the scenes of arson and of explosion are very complicated scenes. And really, um, it is a specialization within forensic science. Arson investigation uh, is a specialized science and it's the pro province of specialists, of specialist forensic experts. So in this set of classes, I have put in a couple of different movies. I'm not going to make, because of the limits of time, I'm not going to require you to watch them. But um, this is a particularly interesting one called Point of Origin, which you may want to watch if you have the time to do so. Uh, it illuminates a lot of the difficulties associated with, with investigation of an arson scene. Because of this whole scale destruction of the scene itself and of attendant evidence, very often the role of the criminalist 
the person who is collecting physical evidence is somewhat limited. And the, uh, it, it becomes limited to doing things like uh, photographing the scene carefully, especially mapping out and uh, noting burn marks, this sort of thing. Um, collecting materials as soon as possible, collecting materials um, that are bit, such as wood, concrete pieces, concrete, whatever it is, and carefully preserving them in such a way that they can be analyzed for compounds which may have been used as starter materials, as fuel in the fire, or in the case of explosions, actually particles of the explosive itself become embedded in these materials and can be analyzed. The uh, criminalist will also be responsible for the initial inspection to see if there's any evidence of starter mechanisms. Very, very often uh, a delay mechanism is used, either a timer or some sort of slow burning thing which will set uh, fire so that the perpetrator has time to leave the scene. It's also the responsibility of the criminals uh, doing this collection to realize that it is not their responsibility to decide whether or not it is an accident or whether it has, is deliberate. That is the province of an arson investigator. The, all of those things which the criminalist initially may, may collect actually become referred to an arson investigator. And the arson investigator is the person who as soon as possible, often during the event itself, during a fire itself, an arson investigator may be called to come and inspect the scene so that they can begin to make a determination about what has, what has actually happened. And a tremendous amount in these situations, a tremendous amount depends on the experience of that arson investigator mainly because so much evidence is lost. Okay, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about fire and then we'll talk about explosions and what the nature of the two is. It's actually not a simple matter. Uh, chemically, a fire is a form of oxidation. That is, we're taking a substance, a fuel, and we are combining it with oxygen. And the result is ultimately, it may, uh, produce side products as well, but ultimately the end point of oxidation is to produce carbon dioxide. Usually carbon dioxide and water are the ultimate burn products during a fire, during an oxidation reaction. A characteristic of oxidation reactions, however, is that they are exothermic. Once you start them, they require a certain amount of energy input to get them started. But once you start them, they, the reaction itself releases energy and it may release a tremendous amount of energy, mostly in the form of heat and light. And that energy can be radiated out. It can, it's radiated out and can be picked up by other sub, substance fuels nearby. And the fire becomes self-perpetuating. The process is propagated because we start a fire in one part of the fuel and it releases enough energy that it starts the fire in adjacent fuel. So it becomes self-propagating. In a fire, that propagation is slow. In an explosion, the propagation is extremely rapid. But obviously, you know, the reason we light a fire for two reasons. First of all, we like the light and pro can provide light for us, but it also produces warmth. It produces heat. And that's the purpose of fire, but it's also the curse of fire because fire can begin to set up combustion, even remote from the, from the source of the flame itself. And the, re the reason that this happens is because the heat is radiated out. Now to start a fire, um, you need to reach a minimum temperature, um, which will set, ignite the fuel. And 
the that is called the ignition temperature. The, that's number the first thing to remember. The ignition temperature is the minimum temperature needed to ignite fuel. The way in which fuel is ignited, we'll discuss in a minute. But the ignition temperature is not the same as the heat of combustion. And the heat of combustion is the heat which is released as the oxidation process proceeds. As the fire proceeds, it releases heat. And that is the heat of combustion. And the heat of combustion can re when the heat of combustion is the same or exceeds the heat of ignition, the ignition temperature, then the fire becomes self-propagating. It's a chain reaction until all the fuel is consumed or one of the other conditions for fire are no longer met. So these are the three things that now that we're going to need to see us to see this process of oxidation proceed. First of all, we've got to have fuel. We've got to have something to burn. Second of all, this is a process which utilizes oxygen. So oxygen has got to be available in sufficient quantity to combine with the fuel to complete the oxidation process. And then we need heat to start it. These uh, processes, sometimes they can start spontaneously, but very seldom do they start spontaneously. Usually we require an input of heat to initiate this combustion. And once we've initiated it, the sufficient heat of combustion must be released so that the process becomes self-perpetuating. As long as those three things are met, then the fire proceeds. And this is also one of the rules of firefighting. Take away any of these and the fire stops. Remove the fuel, nothing is there to be burned. Remove the oxygen, they, you can't, it cannot proceed. Remove the heat, lower the temperature somehow, um, and the, the reactions all stop. So if we change these, we can influence the progress of the fire. So the really important point is the physical state of the fuel that we're talking about. And some things burn much, much easier than other things. And a liquid, for example, burns when the temperature is high enough to vaporize the fuel. And that temperature that vaporizes the fuel may be quite low. Once the, uh, once the fuel is begun to vaporize, then it can be ignited. Okay? But it's not going to be ignited before it vaporizes. So a liquid burns when the temperature is high enough to vaporize it. Solids, on the other hand, usually require a very high temperature before they start burning. And the reason for that is the oxidation process does not take place on a solid. It takes place on a vapor, always. This is a surprising fact because we're used to sitting looking, for example, at a, at a wood fire burning with what wood is burning. It's not actually the wood itself that is burning. The wood is being heated up to such a point that it begins to break down and it releases very complex compounds as a vapor. And those compounds are what are oxidized and what we see as flame. Flame is gas vapors, which have been heated to such an extent that they are releasing light as well as heat. That breakdown of the solid into flammable vapors is called pyrolysis. And the very often things like wood, coal, this sort of thing, they need to be heated up to a very high temperature before they will begin to pyrolyze. And uh, once, once you begin the fire, once you've got enough heat of combustion being released by one part of the fire, then it can begin to pyrolyze areas nearby and they begin to burn as well. 
Now, I know that there are a couple of these terms, but try to get the ter write the terms down with their definitions, okay? Because they they are important. Um, the f we also talk about a flash point, and a flash point is the very lowest temperature at which a substance can give off enough vapor that it can be ignited. Obviously, here we as we discussed here. Um, uh, uh, many liquids, their, their, their uh, flash point is actually quite low. And that is because they vaporize at a low temperature. Think, for example, about something like gasoline or alcohol or something like this. It doesn't, it needs a low temperature bef before it will begin to va vaporize. It vaporizes at a very low temperature. And that vapor is now available to be burned that in the case of the gasoline of these liquids very often the ignition temperature is around between 500 and 800 degrees celsius which is not actually not very very high a match give, has a, a temperature plenty high enough to ignite the vapors released by by um a liquid such as gasoline. Um, in the case of solids, this the the flash point is related, of course, to the process of pyrolysis. We have to high, heat the solids up enough that they start to break down and release uh, vapors. So their flash point is very high. They they require a lot of heat to re release enough vapor to set a light. So once we get the fire going, once we introduce a source of heat, the heat can actually be moved. It gets moved away from its source and it gets moved by three principal mechanisms. The first is by convection. That means, for example, that a flame heats air and it, the heated air is less dense and it rises and it, it moves the heat from one area to another. You can think about the same, th this kind of process happens if we heat a pan of water. Heat water and you heat it at the bottom of the pan, it is, gets distributed throughout the water because the warm water rises and distributes the heat throughout the, the fluid. The same thing happens in air. And this becomes very important in a fire, say in a, in a house, the heat can be from a, one room, for example, can be moved through the entire house by convection. And it may move enough heat, if the flame is, if the fire is fierce enough, it may move enough heat that it will reach the ignition point for materials elsewhere in the house and set them alight, even if there is no naked flame. The other way in which heat is, is moved is by conduction. And you know this, that for example, if you heat a, a metal bar in a fire, very soon the end remote from the flame becomes hot. And that, that, is, the, it, that is happening because the molecules in the bar are being heated and they are heating the molecules next to them. And the heat is actually transferred by conduction. There is a third way, which is very, very important in, in a fire, in an active fire scene. And that is that heat is also m moved by radiation. Heat in actual fact is a form of radiation. It is infrared radiation. And it, it, it um, impinges at it places distant from the flame itself, from the source of the heat itself. We know that. That's why we sit near a fire to warm ourselves. We are being warmed by radiation from the fire. We don't have to sit in the fire to get warm. We sit remote from it, we still get warm. We're being warmed by radiation. But that radiation, if the fire is fierce enough, strong enough, and the heat of combustion is high enough, that radiation may be enough to start a fire remote from the flames themselves in a room that is on fire has a source of flame in it, for example. Surfaces quite remote in that room may be heated enough 
by heat radiation to actually be set alight themselves. And we're going to see that in a while. So remember those three, conduction, radiation, convection. Those are the means of moving heat from its source to other places. And very important in setting and distributing fire through, through a scene. So um, the arson investigator is presented with a very difficult situation very often. They will frequently turn up at an active scene and will immediately start trying to gather evidence. This is one of the instances where you do not need a warrant in order to gather evidence. Because at a fire scene, the evidence, most evidence is at extreme risk of destruction, either by the fire itself or by the attempts to stifle the fire by water, for example, and by people moving through and, and everything else. So an arson investigator at the scene will start to gather evidence immediately. One of the lucky, well, I don't know if it's lucky, but one of the facts about arson scenes is they are very often sp deliberately started using um, some kind of accelerant, a, a liquid fuel, because those liquid fuels like gasoline and everything burn so very easily and can start a fire so rapidly arsonists will very frequently use them to begin, a, to begin a, a fire. And one of the things about them, remember what we said earlier, even a liquid like gasoline, it's not the gasoline itself that's burning, it's the vapors from the gasoline that are burning. This means if you pour gasoline onto a surface, the gasoline very rapidly soaks into the surface. And, but it's the vapors of the gasoline which are set alight and they, they burn in the presence of oxygen. They don't burn deep in the wood or the concrete or whatever it's been poured on. And very often traces, substantial traces of accelerants may be left on surfaces that appear completely burned. And an arson investigator will immediately begin looking at those areas and collecting that material for analysis to see if accelerants are present. One of the first things that an, in, at a, a scene that an arson investigator will do is try to determine what is the point of origin of the fire, because that is very often provides an answer to whether it is accidental or whether it has been deliberately set. It can be very difficult to tell the difference between the two. But for instance, if, a, if an arson investigator can clearly identify a, a point of origin of a fire, and it's an electrical socket with poor wiring in drywall that has been set alight. That is a strong indicator that this is an accidental fire that has resulted from poor electrical uh, setup. Um, on the other hand, a, f a fire which appears to have started for no reason in a piece of furniture or something like that, um, or in that you know has materials gathered around it which have burned, which look like they've been moved there. This may be a, an, uh, an indication that this was deliberately set as, as arson. The arson investigator has other responsibilities as well, because arson is very frequently used to cover up other crimes. It is, arson is performed for many different reasons, very often insurance fraud or something like that but also to cover up other crimes, murder or a scene of a murder, to confuse uh, a crime story. It can be for, they can be set for many different reasons. And it may be the responsibility of the arson investigator to coordinate with the general crime scene investigation in order to provide that kind of input. There are often some very strong indicators of that arson has been has taken place and this is because of the natural way that fire spreads and a fire usually spreads from a point of origin and when it does so it leaves character it moves with characteristic patterns because of con largely because of convection and radiation of heat from the source of of the flame there are some telltale things which say that somebody has deliberately manipulated the scene so that it will burn in a particular way. 
And the one thing is that people committing arson, say in a house or whatever, floor, they very frequently want the entire place to, to go up in flames. And so fires may be set in various places in different rooms. And, but when the arson investigator looks at it, there is no logic to how the fire moved from one place to another. The fire has a point of origin and it has to move if, it's, if there's a single point of origin. If it appears simultaneously in different parts, it's a strong indication that this was set deliberately. The other uh, dead giveaway is that arsonists very frequently will set fires in different parts of a property or wherever by pouring accelerant in different places and then linking those pools of accelerant and then having a leader, a stream that they can light that the flame will run along and then set off all the others. And this leaves characteristic burn patterns linked with what are called streamers. They are lines of burn in between pools of, of burned material, which have resulted from these different patches of accelerant being set alight in this fashion. Remember that the perpetrator doing that is aware of the fact that they need to be careful that they don't burn themselves to death. So they will very often leave a long streamer even to the outside that they can light. So the flame runs and sets off the big fire remote from them themselves. And by the way, another thing that people, that an awesome investigator or investigators in general will look for if they pick up a suspect is to look at the suspect and look for signs of burn on them singed eyebrows, singed hair, singed clothing, charred clothing. Because arsonists very often are not aware of how uh, violent the beginning of a fire, especially one set with accelerant, is. That they, the, when they go through a house and they pour accelerant throughout the house, the vapors very, frequent, very quickly permeate the entire place and it turns into effectively into a bomb. And when they set it, they themselves end up being burned by the flash of the flash flame from, from that in initiation of the fire. So they look, for, the arson investigators will look for this sort of thing. Irregular burn patterns linked one to the other by the streamers. Now, one of the giveaways in setting, in when they set fires in different parts of the house, there is a natural way in which houses will burn down, for example, or that fire will move. And here is one of them. Um, this is a, a this is not a, an arson scene necessarily. This is just a house fire. Um, but the fire has begun here. It's begun here. The arson investigator arriving will be able to tell immediately that the fire began here because already a lot of the fuel here has been consumed. The fire is still burning, but the fire has moved up to these upper stories and it's moved up by convection. If the fire investigator arrives and there is a fire burning here and a fire burning here, it is unlikely that the fire burning there began by convection from, of heat from this fire here. And that would be a sign that might be a sign, not necessary, but it might be a sign that this fire has been set deliberately in different parts of this house. This is a natural burn pattern. This, these upper stories have caught fire much later and they have caught fire from transfer, probably from transfer of heat to the upper stories as this bottom fire burns. The point of origin of a fire is very often marked by a V shape. And here you can see it here. And here again, we have the typic, this typical, here is this, this V shape. Here, the fire has begun down here and uh, it has moved to the upper stories of, of the house by convection, also because, obviously, of course, because it may burn through floors, et cetera, et cetera. But fire in a lower story very frequently sets fire in an upper story. 
without it burning through. Heat is moved by, by convection. Um, have a look at this here. Um, and you just have a look at the place where this has begun. This is the back door. Okay, here are stairs here. And um, the fire has begun here. It's got this distinct V shape here because there's small, ori small origin of flame here and the, the heat moves up and, and it expands out and burns in this V shape. Um, what would your interpretation of this be? Well, it could be that this fire was set deliberately out here. But if I wanted to set a fire, a house of light, unless I was clever, and I was, unless I was trying to be clever, I was trying to make it look like an accident, um, I probably wouldn't set the fire outside. But this is a very typical pattern for a house fire because this is where the trash can is. And trash cans are very common sources of fire. Very commonly people, they may throw barbecue coals they may even take barbecue coals the next day, for example, after they had a barbecue the night before they take them, throw them in, not realizing that they are still burning. And they set the trash can alight and the trash can sets the house alight. Somebody clever might know that and try to set a, a fire which looked accidental, but it would probably be easily able to ascertain if you analyze this area here to see what was it that caused the fire to start. Okay, so once you start a fire, um, especially in an enclosed space, um, there are some special situations actually arise. Um, the first thing is, uh, if you set a fire in one part of a room, for example, the amount of oxygen there available is usually, um, it's not limiting, but it is not lim it is somewhat limited. And what I mean by that is that very often the materials will burn inefficiently. In addition, in a room, many furnishings, many materials, textiles, this sort of thing um, are artificial and they burn, they require a very high temperature to burn absolutely completely. Instead, they partially burn and they produce thick black smoke, thick, very hot black smoke, which ascends up to the ceiling and begins to layer under the ceiling. But that smoke is actually flammable. It, uh, it, it, didn't, it escaped complete burning because oxygen was somewhat limited at the source. But the, at the source of the fire, that fire may be hot enough that it begins to radiate. It radiates heat to other parts of the room. And that heat has nowhere to go, but the source is constant. And as a result, the surfaces in the room, furnishings, everything else begin to heat up and heat up and heat up until they, they begin pyrolyzing and the ignition point is reached and they release masses of vapors into the atmosphere. And now all of a sudden, all of this material is heated combustible and it explodes and it explodes simultaneously throughout. And this is called flashover. And it's an extremely dangerous point. And many firefighters have been killed during these flashover events, attempting to put out a fire, getting caught in an enclosed space and it flashes over in this fashion. Um, I'm not, again, I have problems showing the, these things on, on uh, Zoom. But have a look at this very brief demonstration from a fire department of how flashover occurs. And you'll see what a, dis what a very dangerous situation it is. We suddenly move from fire being in one part of a room to the whole room exploding within seconds. So here are, again, here are some of the things which uh, an arson um, investigator will be looking for. We'll be looking for evidence of burn patterns, origins of the fire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Collecting in those areas, seeing if the if the um, accelerant is still present. 
You also look uh, at the pattern of spread of the fire. But they will also look for giveaways. For example, the presence of any kind of ignition device. As I've said, the perpetrator will very often leave um, behind a some kind of an igniter, something that is timed to give them a chance to leave the scene before the fire begins. There are many ways that this can be done. People are ingenious, but <clears throat> very often uh, the the these traces of these are left behind and a, and a good arson investigator is skilled in recognizing the presence of these. Um, if you watch that little movie, The Point of Origin, this discusses uh, somebody uh, who was a serial arsonist, which is quite frequent occurrence. And um, serial arsonists very often have set patterns of, of setting the fires and they, they have favorite mechanisms which become recognizable. A good arson investigator will begin to be able to link different fires together by the way in which the fire was set. But there are some other things which people often don't, don't think about before they, let's say somebody wants to burn their house down for insurance purposes. Well, that requires considerable planning. This is not a matter of just waking up and tossing a match and setting your house alight and, and claiming insurance. Instead, people plan it. And when they plan it, very often, what they will do is they will leave traces behind that they have been planning. For example, they will load their car up with valuables. They will put valuables into the, into the trunk of their car. They will remove their pets. They will take out extra insurance, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are very substantial clues that this may, this may in fact have been deliberate. And this is the province, maybe not of the arson, it is maybe the province of the arson investigator, but it's certainly the province of investigators and if, if arson has, is suspected. Um, unfortunately, um, as I've said, the fire itself consumes a tremendous amount of the evidence and much of it is destroyed um, by water and often by collapse of, of the structures, uh, that sort of thing. Um, the presence of accelerants is very important. And I'm, I'm not just, there is a lengthy section in your text discussing how accelerants are identified um, in the laboratory, um, which I'm not going to discuss here. But that is a science in and of itself. It uses a, a technique called, largely uses a technique called gas chromatography. Um, these accelerants obviously are all produced commercially and their makeup is determined by the, the people, by the factories, companies, whatever, that produce them from the original fossil fuels usually. They each have characteristic compositions of different compounds in them and different companies, different products from different companies and different products produced at different times by different companies have a fingerprint, have chemical fingerprints, which can be determined in the laboratory and which can be compared to known standards. So the, sometimes the, the arson investigator is lucky enough, the laboratory can provide them with a fing, fuel fingerprint, which is unique enough that they can go out and get information about which service station sold that, that brand of gasoline. When last was that gasoline sold? Near to the, the scene of the fire, which service stations or, or, or what hardware stores carried that particular product? If they do carry it, do they have records of who bought and when? Do they recognize people? All of these are investigative leads which can be gathered from the identity of the fuel itself if the investigator is lucky. In addition, there, is, there are databases uh, which list these different fuel types and their composition, which a sample can be compared with. 
there are ways of going through a fire scene, um, even if uh, it doesn't appear that there's any way obvious to sample for the accelerant. There are ways of going through. You can do it. There are uh, machines which you can use to sniff out um, these accelerants. Um, but uh, one and the, one of the best ways of doing it. Not, but not every not every area will have one available. Um, dogs can be very easily trained uh, to to sniff out accelerants, and they are very very good at finding where accelerants have been deposited in in a fire scene. So um, <clears throat> I remind you about this um, when we talked about how a crime scene is processed. We talked about putting materials from an arson scene um, into cans like this. And this is so that the once inside, this can does not have to be opened again. It is airtight and it has a rubber bung in it and a syringe can be injected in, stuck through the rubber bung and the head space, the gas inside the can can be sampled. Very often, um, all sorts of materials will be collected from the scene. Not only things like wood or, or, or concrete that might have had the accelerant poured on it, but also any leftover textiles, furnishings, these kinds of things are good sources uh, of remaining accelerant. Um, and uh, these cans, in addition, can be heated. Um, they can be heated so that uh, the, the vapors are vaporized and the concentration is increased in the in the headspace before it's sampled. So this is just somebody taking it off. And that would then be subjected to gas chromatograph identification. Um, this is a uh, ILRC stands for Ignitable Liquids Reference Hydrocarbon Collection. And um, it's one of the, the major um, databases for composition of accelerants. Here's the, the URL if you want to go and have a look at it. Okay, so that's our brief discussion about fire. Um, let's have a, a, an equally brief discussion about explosives. What is the difference between a fire and an explosion? Well, it's actually the speed at which oxidation occurs. There are several substances which are explosive, which will also burn under the right circumstances. And there are some substances which essentially are we use for burn, which essentially burn, which we can put into circumstances where they will explode. Um, and it's a question of the speed at which that occurs. An explosion occurs extremely rapidly. And when it, when it occurs, it releases a tremendous amount of gas compared to the volume of the explosive substance, releases a tremendous amount of gas and a huge amount of heat almost instantaneously. And that is the core feature of the explosion itself and of its destructive power. Um, that the, there's something about explosives which makes them different to ordinary fuels. And that is that explosives have their own oxygen source. They do not require an external oxygen source. They have oxygen is actually part of the chemical composition. And during the, the oxidation process, that oxygen is released to fund further oxidation. So an explosive does not require a source of oxygen in order for it to be propagated. It propagates its own oxygen and utilizes that. Um, the other characteristic of an explosive is the speed at which this uh, oxidation takes place very rapid. And in many explosives, the that oxidation occurs throughout the substance almost simultaneously, almost instantaneously. And that is referred to as detonation. So detonation is when an explosive goes off. The entire oxidation process happens during the process of detonation. 
very, very rapidly. This, there's still, you can still measure um, a speed at which that takes place, the speed of detonation. And in some explosives, it takes place relatively slowly compared to other explosives. It still takes place very rapidly. But in some, it's much faster. And the speed of de detonation allows us to define explosives as being high explosives or low explosives. In actual fact, um, it often makes little difference. We can take low explosives and we can utilize them in such a way um, that when they detonate, if we use enough of them, they detonate, um, their impact is as high as that of high explosives. So um, the, this definition of high and low explosives does not necessarily imply that a high explosive is more, more, much more destructive than a low explosive as we'll see uh, in a minute. In any explosion like this, the characteristic of it is it produces a blast wave. That is a pressure wave of incredible pressure, which radiates out from the source of the explosion very, very rapidly. You can think of it like a wind that is generated and if close by, it will be accompanied by the release of a tremendous amount of heat as well. But it's not actually the heat that usually does the major damage in an explosion. It is this blast wave. It travels at about 7,000 miles an hour, many, many, many times the speed of sound. And it is sufficiently powerful that it will shred solid materials um, in its path. Close by, it will be accompanied by burning gas. But as the blast wave moves out, it gathers material, it gathers debris, and it moves it at thousands of miles an hour as well. And that is often what does additional damage, just quite apart from the blast wave itself. Okay, so let's have a look at, at some of the different explosives. A low explosives um, are the most widely used ones are things like gunpowder and what is called smokeless powder. These are commonly used in firearms, for example. And um, they have, they also have this, the black powder, by the way, this is gun, ordinary gunpowder. It's called black powder because that's what it looks like. And it's a simple, simple chemical mixture. It's potassium or sodium nitrate charcoal and sulfur. Um, and um, it was invented in China uh, in about ninth century. So it's been known for a very, very long time. And um, uh, so this is what is, was used right the way into the 19th century, for example, in bullets and in firearms to propel a bullet. Um, but uh, more recently, uh, it's, uh, this is now the province of collectors and people like that. Um, because nowadays uh, uh, a more modern compound called smokeless powder is used. And this is actually a cellulose or cotton uh, based uh, that is combined with nitroglycerin and um, the, it becomes explosive, but it is really, really relatively stable. It doesn't explode very easily, in other words. Now, both of these have a characteristic which applies to many low explosives. And that is, if you do not enclose them, um, they burn. They do not detonate, they burn. You can spread uh, smokeless powder out on the table, you can spread gunpowder out on the table and light it. It will burn very, very rapidly and often quite spectacularly. Um, but it doesn't explode. It doesn't detonate. You don't have the whole lot exploding at once. The explosive power of these is imparted by packing them into a small volume inside a metal casing. And what happens then is that effectively, because they're enclosed like that, they detonate when we want them to. We'll show, I'll show you how we do that. They don't detonate that easily. 
we need to actually detonate them. But once uh, once they, the oxidation begins, it proceeds extremely rapidly and they detonate and they produce a burst of very hot gas in this enclosed space at a very high pressure. Now, if that is enclosed in something like a pipe bomb, it will blast the whole pipe apart and the fragments of pipe will radiate out um, to cause damage. In the case of a bullet, the projectile part of the bullet is the weak point of the whole system. So that when the explosion takes place in the bullet casing, the bullet projectile is shot out by the hot gases and everything else. It's not the, the casing doesn't explode. So, uh, um, the, by the way, the, this um, speed of decomposition is called deflagration. And uh, deflagration occurs in all explosives, and it's what causes this release of uh, hot gases and uh, uh, the resulting enormous pressure release. Okay, so those are the low explosives. Now, the high, high explosives um, are characterized by the fact that they, um, when they are, the oxidation that takes place in them takes place extremely rapidly and violently. Even when, uh, even when they're not enclosed, they can, be, they can explode extremely violently. So there are two kinds of high explosives. The first are primary explosives. And primary explosives are substances which are extremely unstable. They are very, very sensitive to heat, to shock, um, friction, anything like that. Uh, they can be ignited with a spark or a flame, um, but uh, because of their instability, they're actually not that useful for making large explosives. Instead, they are used to set off explosions. So for example, in bullets and things like that, this, the smokeless powder or the black powder is not very reactive or on its own, it's quite stable. But what we do in the bullet is we have that, you remember I showed you the structure of the bullet, we had a little primer at the end of the bullet, which could be exploded just by impacting it with a firing pin. That little explosion is enough to detonate the contents of the bullet casing. And um, that is the characteristic use of these primary explosives. And um, the, another thing is that these uh, tend to be, explode quite violently, um, even if they're not enclosed. Um, so they are, they are really dangerous substances and they're usually used in relatively small amounts. Um, and they are very most commonly used um, to, as detonators for other explosions, which are, won't take place that, that quickly. Now, secondary explosives are substances which they're, they're relatively insensitive to, to heat and friction, that sort of thing. So they're much more stable than the primary explosives. And uh, they also, if you put them into, if you take them into open air and you, uh, um, they have lots of oxygen around and they kind of spread out a bit. They will also burn rather than detonate if they're in small quantities. They characteristically need to be set off. The detonation needs to, needs to be started in some way. And very often the, the detonation is done by using a primary explosive of some sort like this. Um, they, this uh, thing, the, the, the fact that they burn like this uh, in small quantities in, in the open air belies the fact that in fact in large quantities um, they will in fact detonate. And uh, they detonate with such force that uh, they're extremely destructive and they do not require enclosure like in a metal casing uh, or that sort of thing in order for them to propagate this tremendous blast wave. And these secondary explosives 
are the ones which we use industrially for causing blast or blasting and that sort of thing, but are also used in weaponry um, and in creation of bombs, um, both illicit military bombs and illicit bombs as well. Okay, so um, here are a set of, of high explosives. Um, nitroglycerin, actually some people would consider it almost a primary explosive um, because it is an extremely unstable uh, substance, but it is used um, just on, it, on its own, um, but it is unstable is even to things like movement and this is to friction, that sort of thing. So it's very difficult to use. Um, it was one of the initial uh, compounds that was discovered as a high explosive. And there was attempts were made to use it, but often ended up very, in very sad events because it was difficult to control. This was the importance of this gentleman, Alfred Nobel. And Nobel is, was the person who instituted the Nobel Prize. And he did it because his conscience was stricken by what had resulted from his invention of the compound dynamite. And dynamite is actually relatively simple. It's nitroglycerin, which has been stabilized. It's actually mixed with other substances like clays and this sort of thing. Um, and it becomes stable. It becomes stable enough that it can be molded into a form um, and just enclosed often in a cardboard tube or something like that. Um, and it can then, it can then be detonated. It, it can be detonated by electricity. It can be detonated by a primary explosive sometimes uh, by various things. And dynamite immediately became a huge commercially successful product because it made things like blasting, rock, quarries, this kind of thing. It made that very, very easy indeed. And it was part of, of kind of industrial revolution in the 19th century. So these, these secondary explosives, they all require a primary initiator or a detonator of some sort um, in order to be set off. Now, this uh, dynamite, and actually it's still used, um, but it has been superseded by much more modern explosives. And um, uh, many of these explosives, in fact, I'm sorry, let me just go back here, um, are based on substances like this, ammonium nitrate. Now, ammonium nitrate is a fertilizer and it is artificially made. Um, it is part of the agricultural revolution in the 19th century, in the early 20th century because it was our, ammonium nitrate was one of the first pro fertilizer products which was, could be synthesized. And ammonium nitrate, now look at that word there, the nitrate part, that implies that we have there a nitrogen compound with lots of oxygen attached to it. And remember that this is a characteristic of these explosives. They have their own source of oxygen. And this is why ammonium nitrate is, can be made into such a powerful explosive because it fuels its own detonation. So these are the detonators um, are uh, devices, sometimes with a primary explosive, sometimes another kind of device, um, often electrical, embedded into a tube of explosive. In the old days, this would be uh, this would be placed into a dynamite tube, for example. This is a blasting cap, and this is probably got a primary explosive in it of some sort. Um, the, these detonators can be electrical, but sometimes they, they can also be set off by a fuse, um, a cord, which is, is often saturated with something like potassium permanganate or something called burn burn up to the explosive and set it off. All of these so that the person setting off the explosion can be remote from the, from the explosion itself because the explosion is going to generate 
a blast wave and debris. But unfortunately, that makes these explosives the very popular in criminal enterprise, especially in things like terrorism. But don't forget that explosions or explosives are also used um, in destruction, deliberate destruction of property, conceal crimes, but also for insurance and that sort of thing. And ammonium nitrate is very, very common. It's used agriculturally on every farm in the United States and throughout the world. And uh, so it's relatively easily obtainable, or it used to be much more careful. Uh, control is now kept over stocks of ammonium nitrate. Um, the, and it can be very easily turned into a secondary, a high explosive, but a secondary explosive. And uh, this is, these are the remains, for example, of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma, which was blown up by a truck which was laden with ammonium nitrate mixed with fuel oil. And this is a common way of turning it into, into a, a high explosive, converting the fertilizer into high explosive. This is called an ANFO bomb, an ammonium nitrate fuel oil bomb. And it is a favorite um, recipe for terrorists, unfortunately. So just looking at this, many people died in this explosion. That should be fairly obvious. And this was a huge building which was completely devastated by the single bomb and reduced, most of it reduced to rubble. Um, so that, those bombs are extremely, extremely powerful. There are many other uh, formulations of high explosives. Um, these uh, um, TNT, trinitrotoluene, again, very, very high in oxygen, chemically bound oxygen. It's a, this trinitro part tells you there's the oxygen, this toluene part is the fuel part. The trine, that's a whole, the whole package there, oxygen and fuel all in one. That is TNT. TNT is now much more widely used than dynamite and um, uh, is the common explosive in military hardware. It will explode on its own, does not necessarily need to be enclosed, but the force of the, the impact of the explosive is enormously increased, of course, by being enclosed in a heavy metal casing like this because the casing fragments and uh, is uh, propelled outwards at 7,000 miles an hour and does a huge amount of damage. There are others as well. Um, more, the more modern ones like RDX, never mind the name, but uh, and, and there are plastic ones. There are ones, there are explosives which can be molded um, uh, like plasticine, this sort of thing. All of them require some form of detonation, but they are in fact relatively stable um, on their own. Um, and so they can be easily transported. Uh, here's another one. Um, this one is an, an, another illicit one. And um, this is uh, formulations of this triacetone triperoxide. Uh, peroxides are compounds, again, very, very high in oxygen, but also very unstable. So these uh, uh, compounds, uh, um, they are really extremely unstable when they're in their final formulation. They are formed from liquids and the bad guy will mix the liquids immediately before they detonate. And um, that is why you have to throw, turn in all of your liquids when you fly, because this is the, became popular. It never really worked. I don't think there was ever an incident where it actually worked really well on an aircraft. But the famous shoe bomber who tried to set his sneakers, detonate his sneakers, he was using this triacetone triperoxide system um, and went into the bathroom, I think, to mix, mix them. The, so just like a fire, a, an a scene of explosion, 
is a scene of really often of complete devastation. But it has to be, nonetheless, it has to be extremely carefully searched. The identity of the explosive um, is often determined from sampling materials into which the which have had unoxidized uh, explosive blasted into them. And um, so many of the objects uh, around the explosion are collected and looked at to see for, tra for traces of the explosive. The, the site of the explosion, because the blast is so powerful, very often will destroy the what the means whereby it was brought there a vehicle or whatever just is essentially shredded um, and very often a huge crater this is the this is the crater um, i believe in front of the federal no i think this was a bombing in madrid or somewhere but uh, here you can see the crater left behind here but whatever is left there uh, has to be carefully sampled and they will even sample the soils and everything underneath for laboratory analysis. Now here's an, uh, from the Murrah Federal Building bombing in Oklahoma. This is the axle of the vehicle which was used to transport that the, the ammonium fuel oil bomb to the Murrah Federal Building. It was uh, uh, detonated by Timothy McVeigh who was subsequently executed. Um, and uh, he, what he did was he actually lit a, a fuse in the vehicle and walked away rapidly. The, fu the fuse was long enough that he got to another vehicle and drove off before it went off. The, par the, the explosion was so powerful that it actually blasted the axle several blocks away, right the way across buildings into another area of the city but the axle was recovered almost entire. And fortunately there on the axle was the VIN number, the vehicle identification number. And through that, they were able to trace the vehicle to a rider, a rental uh, store. And they had the records which identified Timothy McVeigh as being one of the people, one of the people, there were other people involved but one of the people who had um, rented this vehicle. So obviously um, in these two situations, fire and explosion, they are linked. And a collection of materials from an explosive scene is very, very similar. Um, they may also make use of airtight containers, just as we saw. Um, but the, unfortunately for the investigation, the area of investigation is enormous. The crime scene itself is just enormous. And um, nonetheless, the, the, the entire scene often needs to be carefully, carefully examined um, in order to determine origins and nature of the explosion itself. Remember that explosions do occur by accident as well. The commonest explosion that occurs uh, in cities and everything else is a gas explosion. Um, household gas, which is methane, uh, if it accumulates in a room or, or something like that, actually becomes explosive because it will detonate. The entire amount of gas will explode uh, very, very easily if there is enough oxygen present. And the force of such an explosion, of a gas explosion like that is tremendous and can destroy not only the building, but buildings nearby as well. And is frequent cause of, uh, of mortalities, fatalities. But such an explosion can also look like a deliberately set explosion. And it's up to an arson investigator, an explosion expert as well to determine uh, which is which. Um, okay, so the, um, I encourage you, here is another little movie for you. I encourage you to, to um, look this, at this, um, the hunt for the Unabomber. The Unabomber was a serial bomber who sent mail bombs laden with nails and all sorts of shrapnel. Um, and um, 
they were able to link the bomb. He sent them all over the country over a very long period of time. They were able to link them by clues. They reconstructed the bombs. Um, and by, they're almost like his handwriting. They were able to link them, but never tie them to anybody until he released a statement, a manifesto, which he had published in the papers. And his own family, in this case, recognized his style of writing and suggested they, they knew that he, was, he had real mental problems. They suggested to the investigators that they at least look at him as a possible suspect. And sure enough, they were able to definitively link him when they found out where he was living definitively link him to the bombings. Okay, so that's it. We managed without going too much over time. Um, I just want to remind you all, please, that tomorrow your uh, essays are due. These essays, I have had inquiries, although I've sent, discussed it before, and I have sent emails, etc. cetera, to give the details, and it is in your syllabus. Um, a maximum of three to four pages, please. You are to discuss a true crime, not a fictional event that you saw on TV, but a true crime. You may use a TV program if you want to, but you will automatically be considered for a extra, uh, for you know, a higher grade, if you make use of more than one source of information. In other words, if you're do doing a crime, see if you can find other information about that crime to include in, in your essay. Second of all, do not waste your time telling me the whole story about the crime itself. Give a synopsis of the crime because what you are interested in doing is telling me about the evidence that they collected, the evidence and its significance. Three to four pages maximum, okay? Typed and sent to me please by email. And when you do so, please clearly in your subject, in the subject line of the email state, final paper. All right. Hello, how are you? Uh, okay, go ahead. Hi, Professor. Um, yes. I just wanted to find out, um, is there any specific style that you want the paper in, like APA? No. Or MLA? I don't. You okay. can use APA. If you're used to using APA, that's fine. That's fine. Do do cite your references properly, um, but I know I, I I I don't mind. I do ask people though. Please, please, please write this as carefully as you can. This is a lot of marks, and I'm going to mark strictly. Okay. Um, so watch your grammar and your spelling and everything else, and make sure you tell a good story. But as I say, don't don't focus on the circumstances of the crime unless they're pertinent to the evidence that was collected. Just summarize the crime and what happened, et cetera. But I'm interested in knowing what evidence did they collect and what was its significance. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay then everyone. Um, uh, uh, professor. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, quick question. So, um, I'm like, I know, I know you said, I think, uh, in the syllabus, I think it says like Saturday 31st is the exam. And then like next week says Sunday. Right. So is the exam sat like, is the exam yeah. Saturday or like Sunday? It's as usual. It's the Saturday, okay. Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. It's as oh, usual. Saturday. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. It'll open on Saturday and it'll close on Sunday. Okay. And the, and there will be both, right? Both from the chapters we've done and the comprehensive, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So the, the first part, the first one, you'll see that there'll be two. Okay. Two tests. The first test will just be like a normal class test. It'll be the stuff you haven't been examined on yet. Yeah. Of our last classes. Mm -hmm. The second test is comprehensive and to study for that just go to the three tests that we've already done study carefully through there and understand why those answers were correct okay 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 and, perfect and you, thank you so much and your cream that's a pleasure anyone else okay <laughs>